Well, this is <coughs> probably one of the, the most interesting <coughs> talks that we've seen because uh, what, of course, has happened here is that the whole concept of political and civil rights has been located in a much broader context. And I think that as we talk, as this conversation gets going, what we're seeing, as I said, along with all the charm and self-deprecation, <laughs> is the mind of a historian at work, somebody who is explaining that the obstacles we're facing are located within the economic context, a context of capitalism, a context of militarism, who's identifying the fundamental problems with change, the ambitions of the statement, and just to get the conversation going, I'm just going to read again Article 25 to see if we can focus on this. Everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of him, herself, and of his, her family, including food, clothing, housing, and medical care, and necessary social services, and the right to security in the event of unemployment, sickness, disability, widowhood, old age, or other lack of livelihood in circumstances beyond their control. Motherhood and childhood are entitled to special care and assistance. All children, whether born in or out of wedlock, shall enjoy the same social protection. The message, I think, of Howard Zinn's talk today is not one of pessimism, despite all the obstacles that he's pointed to, but one of optimism, a belief in the transformative possibility of social movements, the possibility of achieving Article 25. And I hope, rather than just sitting in a warm bath of emotion and endorsement where we respect the charm and the intellect of our speaker, we can actually engage on that question of action. So, over to Wadi. Just in Harvard Square alone, just walking in Harvard Square within a half block, I saw four homeless people. People, you know, begging for money. Uh, it's just, it seems in this area where there's so much wealth, um, it's just such a, a, a darn shame. There's just so much homelessness and hunger in this small little, area right here. If you walked a little farther yeah. along Mass Ave. Yeah. We'd come to Central Square. Central Square. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> there's Central Square. There's Harvard Square. That yeah. tells it. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I have a question. Um, I work with the poor among the poor. I spend Excuse time. me? I work among the poor among the poor. I work yeah. in the Philippines for a while. Yes. And I also work in the U.S. for almost 20 years in three states. Now, my question is, what is the future of authentic humanism in the U.S.? Because I didn't see that in my 20 years. What, what is the future? I'm sorry. Authentic humanism, meaning your authentic, sincere concern for people, instead of politicians, part of, uh, Democrats, or Republicans. Mm. Because that's what I saw for 20 years in here. What did you see? That everything's politics. It's about Clinton, it's about Bush, it's about yes. Obama, and so on and so forth. Well, what about the poorest among the poor? Because I work with these people for years in this country. And expect too much, probably, because you're right. This is a very rich country. I could imagine you have a problem here today, actually, because I work in the Philippines among the poorest among the poor. I saw how people doesn't eat twice a day. They eat roots. They don't have portable water. And I saw the military, of course, some military are good, some are not, killing civilians. I touched them, the dead people. So the U.S., according to Carno, uh, is Philippines the first colony of the U.S. I don't know if it's true. Can you enlighten me that, the future of humanism in the U.S.? The future of humanism in the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on us. I thought it to put it another way. I think the humanistic feelings, concern, are there in people. I really believe this. I don't believe, you know, that there's nothing, uh, despite the fact that some people have advanced this theory, there's nothing inherent, uh, nothing in, <coughs> in people which predisposes them uh, to violence or fierce competition or lack of concern for others. I, I, and I think we see that in in spite of all the obstacles put in the way of caring for other people, now when there's a disaster strikes which becomes palpable to other people and they become aware of it, they react and they want to help. So I believe the, you know, the potential is there for a humanist approach. And, and it's a question of uh, you know, getting rid of some of these obstacles to, to that of 
removing all the, the uh, layers uh, of culture that stand between the, uh, what I think are the natural humanistic instinct, instincts of people, you know, and the world out there, yeah. That's a follow up to that. Uh, it's interesting, um, you look at the history of American capitalism. Um, would you say that the greed, okay, that is being talked about today, the greed, that's a big G, you know, uh, has it gotten worse? Or is it simply that this generation uh, has not learned anything from the 1800s, let's say 1850s, where there was a, a bit more responsibility? At least they talk about generational theft, you know, of this high uh, ex excessive budgets. But uh, what would you, uh, how would you categorize the greed in the, you know, the, in, the, in the business world, you know, in the corporate world, <coughs> and, uh, and Wall Street, etc., versus the average poor person that's content to be? Uh, how would you uh, advise the corporate America's greed to, to uh, you know, what strategy would be effective to, to make them much more conscientious about the, uh, at least be content with what they have and try to give out to the poor oh. voluntarily, I mean, to some extent. Oh. How can we overcome the greed of the corporate rich? And can we persuade them to be less greedy? I think we can persuade them by scaring them. Yeah. I'm serious about this. Yeah. I don't, I don't, uh, the, I know there's a certain kind of utopian uh, idea in, among people who believe in nonviolent change. And the utopian idea is, and sometimes it's expressed this, Love your enemy, or, you know, and uh, uh, if you love your enemy, your enemy will come around. Um, even Martin Luther King did not believe that. <laughs> oh, because he didn't simply love his enemy. He boycotted his enemy. He picketed his enemy. He, he challenged, you know. And uh, so, uh, no, I think, you know, I'm thinking back to uh, my time in the South and. I'm thinking back to when we were trying. Now, I was teaching at this black college in Atlanta, and we were, you know, making forays against the system of segregation. And we decided the students decided some of us were, were supporting them. And, um, we're going to desegregate the big department store in Atlanta, which is appropriately called Rich's Department Store, <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, and uh, what will we do? Can we persuade Mr. Rich? Mr. Rich isn't a, a demon. He's just a rich department store owner. And can we persuade him to end the segregation? Can we appeal to him the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, the uh, Ten Commandments, <laughs> love thy neighbor, and all of that? Uh, can we appeal to him to do away with segregation? Well, appeals were made, and they didn't work. And then the black community decided to boycott riches. Don't buy at riches, which depended a lot on the black purchasers in the city of Atlanta. And then Mr. Rich came around. Anyway, greed, no, I don't think, you know, greed is built into this system, and I don't think you can simply persuade people not to be greedy but I think you have to create situations where, yeah, they have to stop being greedy or else they will face consequences which actually cut into their <laughs> fortunes, uh, strikes and boycotts and so on. You said, you said yeah. that socialism is the only gang in town. I'm sorry? You say, I have enjoyed your presentation very much. You say that socialism is only the game in town. Can you come a little closer so I can hear you? Because my hearing is very good. Capitalism, capitalism. capitalism yes. is not the only game in town. Okay. Which is yes. socialism yes. is the only game. Yes. And only. And also, yeah. <laughs> the, 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 the way you see socialism is not like 
the experience of the Soviet Union. Okay? Something else. How, how do you see, how would you see the, that kind of new socialism or the something else socialism that could be something like an alter, alternative to this uh, current situation where the uh, Article 25 is not uh, fulfilled everywhere? Okay, so, uh, sorry, just, just in case you didn't care. He's saying that uh, you said that socialism is not represented by the Soviet Union. So what alternative vision of socialism do you have oh. which you could propose under which Article 25 and other things could be realized? Mm. Could you talk about a non-Soviet Union form yes. of socialism? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. As I said, I, I, I don't think what they had was socialism. Mm -hmm. And I was pointing to the, you know, the examples of socialism. Mm -hmm. You know, in the United States, in the early part of the 20th century, there were several million people who read socialist newspapers. And it, it was a, you might say, a popular movement, not a majority movement, but millions of people were captivated by the idea of socialism. Mm -hmm. Some of the great artists and writers <coughs> of the time considered themselves and sp spoke about socialism. Uh, so there, there is, and what is it, you know, and that's, I suppose, what you're asking, what is this vision that is not a bureaucratic, Stalinist vision of socialism? And it's, uh, it's the idea that oh, we will have, a, um, yes, a government, agreed, a, a government, yes, uh, a go government which is uh, re responsive to the needs of people, responsive probably because the government is no longer uh, bound up with a, a two-party system dominated by corporate wealth, <laughs> you see, but a, a government which is much more uh, a democratic government, a, a government which uh, which is so close to the people that you don't have 50% of the people staying away from the polls, you have 80% of the people voting because they actually believe in this government. And, and you have a government which institutes without setting up a bureaucracy, I, and I realize I'm, I'm outlining, you know, something which we have to imagine uh, rather than point to an example, although there are examples of, of systems which go in that direction. That is, we have examples of, of uh, the Scandinavian countries or New Zealand, or countries that have much, much more humane social welfare programs than we have, you know, where, where they don't have extreme poverty and where people, everybody has health care and so on. So it's not as if it's a totally uh, out, outlandish idea. We have, uh, we have countries that, that show in some way, you know, that possibility. And, and, and it can be done. We have the resources to do it. We can, the government <coughs> can, uh, and, uh, we can look upon this as something very practical that, that could be done in the United States. If, if Obama and the political leadership were bold enough, you know, uh, they could, yeah, they could have a government uh, health program in which everybody gets free health care, paid for by taxation, by a very progressive tax, paid for by, you know, uh, taking hundreds of billions out of the military budget. We can have the government guarantee jobs to everybody who is unemployed, not wait for private enterprise to give people jobs, or not, not try to work everything through businesses uh, and through, through the private sector in order to get things done. Oh, if, if a private sector can do things efficiently and humanely, fine, let them do it. It's not a matter of having a, an absolutist uh, uh, refusal to have a private sector. No, wherever a private sector can work, fine, but where it obviously doesn't work, where it doesn't give health care, where it doesn't build housing for the poor, where it doesn't employ everybody who needs a job, no, then the, the government steps in. The New Deal, it actually showed possibility. New Deal gave jobs by the time the WPA, the Works Progress Administration, had finished its work in the days of the New Deal, the government had given jobs to eight million people. And, and, and they had accomplished wonderful things around the country. You know, they had 
built playgrounds and and uh, had parks and and oh huge uh, numbers of of, of uh, art uh, situations through the federal arts program, uh, so that uh, these things can be done, and they can be done without uh, you know, Stalinist uh, uh, camps and so on. You know, I don't know why people think they must. You must, in order to to give people these things, you must have uh, total totalitarian control of the population. No. It's possible. Um, I like the, if I had to sum up, I'm now going to sum up my idea <laughs> in three words. Uh, Dalton Trumbo, whose name some of you may recognize, who was a, he was a Hollywood screenwriter, who one of the Hollywood Ten, jailed for refusing to answer questions to the House on American Activities Committee. Uh, and Dalton Trumbo, um, wrote a wonderful novel, by the way, which I urge all of you to read, called Johnny Got His Gun, which, if it doesn't set you against war forever, uh, has not done its job. But Dalton Trumbo was once asked, what do you believe in? And he said, well, I can put it in three words. Socialism without jails. Yeah. Well, yes. Let's let the society take care of people, not not depend on the profit motive to take care of people, because if the profit motive is allowed to operate, then only those things will be done which are profitable to corporations. No, you. there was a kind of basic slogan in, in, in classical socialism, production for use and not for profit. You produce things according to human needs, not according to whether they're profitable or not. And you can do this without a a totalitarian bureaucracy. I got so depressed reading uh, your book called The People's History of the you United got States. Oh. Reading my book. Oh my God. <laughs> what did you say? Le I got so depressed reading it that I decided I had to do so I didn't know about the Arawaks, for example. You started out in 1492. How much of the book did you read? From start to finish. Really? And you left me a thin read. You left me a thin read, which was basically organized, what you're saying here. So the thing, I did, that's the thing that I decided to do was, you know, you talk about the Constitution. I think you said the Constitution is the best social control document in the world or ever devised. Well, did you read about the labor movement and the oh, movements all of the 60s? Oh, the all, of all of it. All of it. All of it. Did that depress you? I just uh, limited an impact of those things. Oh, I'm sorry. It was a little depressing. <laughs> but not, wait, wait. Not to, not to apologize. What I decided to do, the, the, looking at the Constitution as a social control document, it's great propaganda, starting with the preamble. So I said, why not have every school child, every government office start their meeting, start their day with a recitation of the U.S. preamble? It's not bad. You know, it's not bad. We the people, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, provide for the, or, or ensure the domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare. Welfare is in the first sentence of our Constitution. And if you get all that other stuff handled, maybe you can uh, uh, secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. You know, that's not a bad list of priorities. Succinct, powerful. The preamble to the Constitution is very nice. Yeah. <laughs> so if no, it's good. It's no, like it, Article Twenty Five. Yeah. It's it's good good statement. The problem is to yeah. make it come alive. And I think to make it come alive, it has to be in everybody's minds. Like if kids said it every morning, all together. If if courts started out with the recitation of the preamble, if government, if the Senate, the House, none of this bullshit about the Pledge of Allegiance. You know, when I went to Vietnam, I did not swear my allegiance to a flag. I promise to support and defend the U.S. Constitution. Mm. I'm afraid we're very much coming to the end. We've got a uh, last question. Thank you. Uh, this is actually, I think, a good follow-up to that, perhaps. Um, you touched earlier on Charles Beard, who, in mm. his economic, <coughs> economic interpretation of the uh, Constitution, mm. talks about how uh, there's a built-in, intentionally built-in bias in the Constitution um, in favor of the rich versus the poor. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what specifically is in the Constitution that creates that bias, and perhaps more importantly, 
what even today, after the various amendments to the Constitution, still exists in the Constitution that creates the bias of the rich versus the poor. <coughs> what in the Constitution creates the kind of bias I'm talking about that is a bias in favor of the rich? Um, mostly by omission. That is, there are no economic rights in the Constitution. Uh, and that's why Roosevelt, in, at one point, proposed an economic bill of rights. We have a political bill of rights, but we don't have an economic bill of rights. So but the, uh, the Constitution does not give uh, people uh, the right to work less than 16 hours a day. It doesn't give people health care. It doesn't guarantee a job. The Constitution does do the kinds of things that are mentioned in Article 25. They're not there. And, and so, so if the Constitution gives us political rights, the, you know, in the, like in the first ten amendments, which, by the way, were not there in the original Constitution, right? We added after only, only a certain amount of agitation against the Constitution. So um, the, uh, the Constitution um, uh, leaves out these things. It, it, it omits fundamental rights that people need. But, but also, uh, you know, the Constitution, as it was adopted, uh, you know, in the Constitution was a, a fugitive slave clause that, that said that the national government will make sure that fugitive slaves are returned to their masters. Uh, the, the Constitution says, no state shall impair the obligation of contract. It's a very important clause in, in, in the Constitution. No state shall impair the obligation of contract. What it means is that the existing economic arrangements in the system are something uh, that shall not be interfered with. The, the contract between a tenant and a landlord, between an employer and an employee, uh, those are sacrosanct. And, and, uh, uh, they sh yeah, and, uh, uh, contracts, um, are in the existing situation and in the situation that existed at the time in the Constitution and, uh, and still in this situation, contracts are contracts uh, not between equals. The contract between a landlord and a tenant is not an equal situation. Contract between employer and employee, not an equal. So when you don't, <laughs> when you assert that, you know, you're not going to impair the obligation of a contract, you, you are asserting a, a a kind of um, dedication to the status quo. Uh, so, yeah, the, um, the, the Constitution, and, and of course the Constitution by giving the central government <coughs> the power to raise an army and to levy taxes, uh, you know, created a situation where uh, it could use that army to quell rebellion and, and well, I'm very sorry to have to bring this to, to an end. Um, it's been a very moving experience and very, very grateful uh, to Hudson for coming, to all of you for attending. This talk began with the idea of knowledge, and I thought that was a very powerful way of beginning because he began by saying, do you really know? I mean, you say you know. Do you really know? What do we know? And government inaction, policy inaction, is often justified, either from statements about knowledge, oh, we know what the answer is to this, we have the answer to this, it's just a question of implementation, or from the point of view of action, this is politically impossible, this cannot be done. The wonderfully delivered, very charming, understated talk, in fact, is revolutionary in its impact because what Howard Zinn is saying is we don't know, we need to know more, we can know more, that not to be pretentious, the truth is very powerful. Simply analyzing what is the justification for spending $700 billion on a military budget, what other alternatives might be available to us, what is politically and politically impossible. To take on the question of what President Obama implicitly believes, surrounded by his policy advisors, affected by his idea of his constituents, 
his notion of what he cannot do on health care, what he cannot do on social services, of what he still has to do in foreign policy and with the military. If this university means anything at all, if this government school means anything at all, it's about those two things. It's about knowledge and it's about action. And I think it's extremely important for us, not just to listen to Howardson, but to take on internally the optimism and the power of that kind of analysis as we go on with our work. So thank you all very much.